Good evening. And welcome to the Beverly Presbyterian Church on this April Fool's Day, 2020, but more significantly tonight, it is Monday, Thursday, a very special night in the uh, ministry of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So welcome to all of you. Um, for our call to worship tonight, words are not going to be displayed, so the responsive things I will have to be doing pretty much on my own unless... Well, I, Tom maybe read for the congregation, but I know people can hear better if I'm speaking up here too. So um, you'll hear more from me from, than you might normally do. But anyway, our help is in the name of the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. Amen. Why do we gather to worship on this night? To remember the table, the basin, and the garden. Why do we remember the table? Here we taste God's love for us, given in broken pieces. Why do we remember the basin? Here we feel God's love for us, flowing out over our dust and shame. Why do we remember the garden? Here we awake to God's love for us, poured out in prayers. Why remember at all? The table, the basin, and the garden, they tell us who God is, and who we are. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our hymn of praise this evening is number 219. It is here, O my Lord, I see thee. Number 219. And just a second. We'll do the first and... Um, Second stances, please, at 219. Jesus did come, of course, to relieve us of our sins because we are not the people that God intends us to be, nor that most of us intend for ourselves to be either. So as individuals and as a congregation, let us join together in a prayer of confession. Let us pray. God of mercy and love, when Judas went out that door, a part of each one of us went with him in one way or another. And when the disciples sat unmoving at the table, each waiting for the other to wash their feet, a part of each one of us sat there with them. We have all sat unmoving, waiting for someone else to do what we should be doing ourselves. Let us pray silently.
Amen. Even though Jesus' disciples betrayed him, had no heart for serving others, and resisted his example, Jesus' glory shines because he still loves them and gave his life for them. And now, children, just as Jesus washed the first disciples, he washes you and removes all of your sin. If our glorious teacher and Lord can do this for us, then we can take his example of bowing down in service to others. By this, everyone will know that you are disciples of Jesus Christ, if you have love one for another. The Old Testament lesson this morning, or this evening rather, is taken from Psalm 116, beginning with the first verse. Hear these words. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. How can I I repay the Lord for all of his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. And reading from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John, first 17 verses, and then we'll move to 31b. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was, was, and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, A person who has a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. When Judas was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I will tell you, Where I am going, 
you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Here ends the readings. May God open our hearts and our minds to the message. This time, Bob's going to favor us with a, a number, an upper room did our Lord prepare. It's an English folk melody. Some hands are clapping quietly, inaudible. Thank you. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth, and may the thoughts, the meditations, and reflections of this your congregation find acceptance and pleasure in your sight, Lord, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. It was a week like no other. After our Jewish Sabbath, the other disciples and I had approached Jerusalem with Jesus on the first day of the week. It was quite a welcome that Jesus was accorded. It included welcome mats as people took off their cloaks to place in Jesus' path. It was reminiscent of the glorious entrance of Judas Maccabeus into Jerusalem nearly 200 years earlier when he and his brothers had liberated our Jewish homeland from the Seleucids and especially from that horrid Antiochus Epiphanes. Then the people had been dancing, 
Scripture had been celebrated. Palms were being waved and children were singing. And with Jesus that day, it happened again. It was quite a day. But there was, of course, a notable difference. Unlike Judas Maccabeus, Jesus did not ride a war horse. Rather, he rode upon a donkey, a beast of burden. That seemed odd, even peculiar. But then King Solomon had also ridden a donkey during the time when he was being anointed king of Israel. Oh, to return to the glorious days of David and Solomon. But that was not to be. Jesus had other designs. While the other disciples and I spent our nights outside Jerusalem and Bethany, during the days of that week, we went up to Jerusalem with Jesus. And while Jesus engaged the temple leaders and the Pharisees debating matters of theology, the disciples and I continued to enjoy Jesus and to marvel at him. He had such wisdom, such understanding, and he had a way of making the most complicated issues so much simpler than those religious leaders. You could tell, though, that Jesus was frustrating them. It was even funny at times. Jesus always seemed to be one step ahead of them and try as they might, rather like a child trying to follow in the footsteps of his father. They could never catch up to Jesus' wisdom, his understanding, his teaching. Not that I could either. I had been a mere fisherman until Jesus called my brother Andrew and me to be his disciples. I thought it was rather unusual that Jesus had chosen someone like me, Peter, to be one of his disciples. Others would have seen much more likely candidates. But then none of his disciples was particularly highly regarded by the standards of the day. We were such a motley crew, fishermen, farmers, a zealous patriot, a tax collector. Apart from Jesus, we would never even have associated with one another. Jesus, though, had a way of drawing people together, no matter their background. People would never have dealings with one another, associations with one another, were suddenly sitting side by side, sharing meals with one another, even working with one another and for one another. We disciples, we loved Jesus. Because we love Jesus, we learn to respect and even love one another. It was truly remarkable. None of that, though, seemed all that evident on this night, this Thursday night. We'd gone up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of the Passover to commemorate the liberation of the Jews from the Egyptians under Moses, the great lawgiver. That Thursday, Jesus had sent John and me into town to set things up for the Passover meal. It was a task that John and I rather relished. Openly, we wondered when Jesus would follow up on his royal entrance into Jerusalem just days before and declare a new kingdom with himself as leader, a theocracy, that is, a kingdom under God. The time certainly seemed right for such a declaration. Maybe Jesus would leave the supper and make his public declaration that he was taking over, initiating the age of the Messiah. And maybe, just maybe, John and I would be appointed prime ministers of the realm. It was a tantalizing thought as we set things up for the Passover feast. John and I dared to dream. And they were pleasant dreams. It didn't take us all that long to set things in order in the upper room for the Passover celebration. And soon we returned to Jesus and the other disciples. And soon thereafter, we as a group, Jesus and his 12 disciples, made our way to the upper room to celebrate the Passover. But when we got to the upper room, it didn't take long to realize that there was a problem. 
Palestine, especially in and around Jerusalem, tends to be dry. Jerusalem only gets an average of 16 inches of rain per year. And nearly half of that comes in January and February. Like I said, it is dry. And with all the walking that we did back then, it was dusty. Our feet, especially after walking a few miles, were covered with the dust, coated with it. And that was apart from the animal residue deposited on the streets and alleys. During Passover, especially in the Holy City, there was a lot of that too, with all those sheep and goats and cattle being sacrificed. Everyone had dirty feet. And it felt good to have your feet washed when you would come inside. But neither John nor I had arranged for anyone to wash feet. We had arranged for a pitcher to be filled with water and a basin to wash our feet. There were a couple of towels near the basin, but it was too late to summon a servant to perform this menial task. I didn't know what to do, what to say. So I pretended to ignore the problem. And I guess... The other disciples, they too didn't want to say something lest Jesus appoint one of them to do this menial task. That picture and that basin represented an elephant in the upper room. We all recognized the problem. It was obvious. But no one wanted to or dared to mention it. And certainly no one wanted to get down and do such a menial task. That was for servants, and the least of the servants at that. Hey, my brother Andrew and I, James and John too, had had servants to do such things. None of us ever washed feet. But no one was stepping forward to do it either. This was embarrassing. I thought we had arranged for everything. You know, John should really have taken care of this, even if it had slipped my mind. It was John's fault. It wasn't part of the liturgy of Passover, yet we couldn't enjoy a Passover celebration without having had our feet washed first. Yeah, this elephant in the room was due to John's neglect. He should have thought about this. He should have arranged for it. And now that he didn't, he should get on his knees and do it for the rest of us. Yes, John should be washing our feet. But for his part, John wasn't doing anything either. He was just standing there like the rest of us, standing around knowing that there was wrong, something was wrong, but doing nothing to rectify it. There was an elephant in the upper room. And it was John's fault. And he wasn't doing a thing about it. For their part, the other disciples were noticeably uncomfortable. We all knew what the situation was. We all knew what to expect, and we all recognized the problem. But hey, none of us disciples wanted to do this menial servant's task. So the elephant remained in the room. Until until Jesus unfastened the belt around his waist, took off his outer garment, and knelt to wash our feet. While we all tried to remain noble and proud, Jesus did the noble thing. He knelt down and began to wash When it came my turn to have my feet washed, I objected. How could I allow Jesus, the one whom I had personally confessed as the Christ, the Son of the living God, how could I allow Jesus to wash my feet? It was wholly out of order. And I told Jesus as much. I objected to Jesus. I told him I would never allow him to wash my feet. Jesus had once rebuked me, for, rebuked me for suggesting that as the Christ, he should not suffer. This was not dissimilar. 
So when Jesus persisted, I suggested to Jesus that not only my feet needed to be washed, the whole of me needed to be cleansed. This was but the most recent evidence that I was too proud, too arrogant for my own good, and certainly too arrogant for the kingdom of God. I asked Jesus to wash me wholly, that is entirely, and to make me holy. Jesus countered, suggesting that washing my feet would be sufficient. And with that, I relented. I allowed Jesus to wash my feet as he in turn washed the feet of each of us disciples. Jesus even washed the feet of Judas. I had no idea what Judas was up to, and neither did any of the other disciples. Judas was planning to betray Jesus and hand him over to the authorities. Jesus knew it. He knew everything about us, and yet he washed the feet of Judas as well. History's greatest betrayer, one of my fellow disciples, had his feet washed by Jesus, the very man that he would in turn betray. It was perplexing, absurd, and it remains so today. It is ironic how the purest and most noble of human beings could lower himself to perform this most menial of tasks, even for the man who was going to turn around and betray him. And yet, that was Jesus. That was the character of this man. That was just who he was. He had enjoyed communion with his Heavenly Father, but he emptied himself, as my brother Paul expresses it. He emptied himself and became a servant, a servant to all of us. He's your servant too, you know. He doesn't have to be. He doesn't have to do it. And yet he does. He served us by coming to be one of us, and by teaching us, and by showing us how we ought to live. And then became our servant. Jesus took our place when he allowed himself to die on our behalf. And what's more, he died the most ignoble of ways, crucifixion. The Romans adopted this form of capital punishment as a means to cause excruciating pain and prolonged agony. It was a horrible way to die. Some people hung there, suspended between the earth and the heavens, exposed to the elements for a couple days until they finally expired, usually from asphyxiation when their lungs simply would give out. Of course, that was after their legs would no longer be able to shove the torso of the body upwards to give the lungs room to function. Hanging on a cross is more than a body can bear. And that's how Jesus died. That's how he was executed. Jesus died rather like that innocent lamb was sacrificed and its blood shaken on the sides and tops of the door frames. Jesus was given up for slaughter much like a Passover lamb. His blood betected the door to heaven. And because of him, you and I can enjoy entrance into fellowship and communion with God our Father in heaven. Jesus came to serve us. And because of his service, we enjoy privileges the likes of which we could never imagine apart from Jesus. Thank God. Thank God for Jesus and his washing our feet. And the rest of us too. Washing us clean and making us whole, even holy. But never forget, it's not just what Jesus did. It's what we should do. Jesus humbled himself, and so should we. Jesus came to serve us. And so should we offer our lives in humble service to God 
and to others. Let us pray. Lord, we know there was an elephant in that upper room. An elephant that everybody knew was there. And you took it away. You took the elephant away as you have taken away so many negative things in our lives and turned them around and made them positives. God, for your grace, for your love, for your care. For Jesus, we give you thanks. And we pray that we might be stewards of all that he is and all that he represents to us. For it is in his holy name that we ask and pray it. Amen. There's only a couple of announcements I have which I'll share this evening. Um, there will be a Good Friday service tomorrow at the United Methodist Church down the street. And um, when I was trying to contact Anna Thomas, their new pastor, I went to their website and uh, looked down for the church address and stuff like that. And as I was going down, I noticed they were having a Bible study listed on Tuesday nights, and then they were having a Bible study on Friday nights. And then I looked at the one for Tuesday nights and it was the one from Beverly Presbyterian Church that they were listing. I thought that was a fantastic ecumenical gesture. I truly appreciate it. And I look forward to serving um, our Lord tomorrow night next to Anna. And there will be a representative I know from St. Stephen's as well. So anyway, that'll be at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. It will be live streamed, and there is a web address. Um, yeah, can't call the office, but I know it's been published. Joe, where is that web address published? Okay, it's on the screen, so copy it down, and you'll be able to go there tomorrow night. I think it'll be on Facebook as well under the United Methodist Church, but anyway, tomorrow night at 7. Um, Tracy Sarnowski asked me or asked us that we would pray for her brother John Tuzi. He's going to have surgery for four dislocated discs, I think, in the neck area. But anyway, we certainly remember Tracy's brother in our thoughts and prayers. Also keep T Casey Torres in your thoughts and prayers. She has suffered a stroke and uh, she is hopefully recovering and maybe we'll be able to see her back in one of those pews right back there where she typically sits on a Sunday morning. But anyway, we pray for her and for Shirley and uh, Chalky as they care for her. We are not having an Easter dawn service, or at least the one in which we're going to participate this year because of the COVID. Again, getting together is kind of a uh, dubious thing at this point. But uh, yeah, that will not be this Sunday, but we will have a regular service at 10 o'clock in the morning. We're going to have the lilies. The praise band is going to be here. They left some of their remnants behind, and they'll be uh, lead us, leading us in some song. And, of course, Bob will be here to lead us in our own singing as a congregation. So that'll be on Sunday morning. Anything else I should have mentioned? Okay. If not, then this time our gifts tithes and offerings will be presented.
On a night long ago, your son offered himself to us in servanthood, in bread and wine, in body and blood, and in washing the feet of his disciples. We celebrate the love we only dimly comprehend, your love for us, O God, in Christ Jesus. As we seek to understand the magnitude of his and your gifts, O God, help us to give of ourselves to you and to the world your son came to save. Here we offer you our time, our talents, our substance, ourselves. In the name of him who gave himself up for us, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, this is a joyous feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west, from north and south, and sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. This is our Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. Let's join in the spirit of prayer. Let us pray. The hour came when chaos was no more as you lifted the cup of creation and poured it out. Stars danced in night skies, cattle lowed in the meadows, rivers flowed down to oceans, you offered us a drink from the fountains of living water. But we reach for the cup of bitterness and anger which sin and death offer to us. You sent women and men to sing to us of all the promises you made, but we continued to distance ourselves from you out of an abundance of caution, taught us by temptation and death. That is why you decided to send your child to us, because we broke your heart over and over and you are the only one who could heal it. Therefore, those who are quarantined by fear, with those we love so much, yet remain isolated from, we join our voices in singing your praise. Holy, holy, holy are you, God of the forgotten and afraid. All creation teaches us how to praise your name. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who kneels to wash us with grace. Hosanna in the highest. your holiness beyond our understanding, God of love. And you have blessed us with the gift of Jesus. He could have remained isolated from us, but he chose rather to set aside glory to become one of us. He could be self-quarantined from our foolishness and quarrels, but he left glory's company to walk with us. He could have worn a mask so that he could not breathe in our fears and confusion but he came into our midst to sing songs about you. He could have forsaken the cross, but he took it up, giving his life so we could know that we are never alone, even in the most isolated moments, but rather surrounded by your resurrection love this night and every moment to come. As we gather in these moments of isolation, we pray our brokenness be made whole as we would drink the cup of grace. We pray that we would be filled with hope as we gather around coffee tables or in kitchens. We would remember that faith is a mystery. In remembrance, we sit at the table with our friend. In remembrance, we weep over his passion and death. 
in remembrance. We long to celebrate the resurrection in remembrance. We look to the day when we will be gathered together. On that night so, so long ago, you poured your spirit upon your children about to share a meal before scattering from the slave masters and power brokers. On that night so long ago, you poured out your spirit upon your children about to share a meal before they scattered to leave Jesus alone to face death. On this night, now pour out your spirit on the gifts of the bread and cup and on your children that scattered in so many places. May the bread which is broken remind us that we are made whole by your love, even as we seek to be faithful in caring for all those who seem so far apart from us in these days. And may the cup from which we drink remind us that we are filled with your grace, so we might be people of hope in times of despair, so we might be people of love in times of anger, so we might be people of peace in the face of fear. And when these long days and nights of isolation are over, and when we are once again gathered as your people, we will join hands and dance around your meal, singing glory and honor and praise and love to you, God of our hearts in every moment, Jesus of our hopes in every night, spirit of our love in every person. Amen and amen. Our Lord Jesus, in the very night in which he's betrayed, took bread. And after he had blessed it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after he shared that Passover feast with his friends, Jesus took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. When you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul reminds us that every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The blood of Christ poured out for you. Let us drink and be thankful. Can you get the cup? Let's pray. God, we are so thankful for your overwhelming love. Father, we are so thankful that you sent your Son to live our life and to die our death. Jesus, we are so thankful that you laid down your life for us, that in your spilled blood and your broken body, we might have our sins forgiven and our lives redeemed. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you make Jesus real to us. We praise you, our great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We rejoice in our salvation, and we pray that you would draw our hearts closer and closer to you, that you would have your way in our lives as individuals and in our lives as your people, that we would be those who proclaim your glory, who crown you king. We are so thankful that you invite us to come to you with the things that cause us care and concern because you care for us. And so we lift our cares to you tonight. We pray for Tracy's brother-in-law, John, as he faces surgery. We continue to lift up Pat and Barbara Judd to you, Deanna Allen's brother, Mark. God, we um, thank you that Joe is feeling better. We lift up Sue Carter and her family as they grieve the loss of her brother, Rex. 
God, we pray that you would be close to the brokenhearted, that you would be with those who are struggling, that you would be meeting the need of those who feel they are living in lack. God, we pray that you would strengthen the weary, that you would bring hope to the discouraged, that you would reveal yourself in brand new ways that hearts would belong to you. God, we pray as we walk through this week toward resurrection, that you would be with pastors as they preach your message. We pray for Pastor Keith. We pray for the pastors in our community. Lord, we pray for the hearts of people who are going to tune into services and who are going to walk into churches, that they would come to the place, that they would know you, that they would love you, that they would surrender their hearts to you. So be glorified. Be magnified, be exalted, be lifted high. We give you the glory and the honor and the power and the praise that you and you alone are worthy of. And we lift our prayers to you with great confidence, not because of the size of our faith, but because of the size of our God. And because we lift them up in the name above every other name, in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, and our King, and all God's people said, Amen. Our hymn of departure this evening is number 222. Let us break bread together. We'll do two verses. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody who's gone through a confirmation class in our Protestant tradition, and even Roman Catholics for that matter, would not identify the pitcher and the bowl as a sacrament. And yet it is very sacramental, for it teaches us almighty truths about Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. May we not only look at a pitcher and basin, may we let that pitcher and basin inspire us to be like Jesus tonight and always. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace today and always. Amen. Oh,